Today I'm going to tell you about what we have come to call the elements of decision alignment. This is an interdisciplinary collaboration This is an interdisciplinary collaboration where I'm focused on the computer science, but with a long-standing interest in economics. And my colleague, Bill Tulla, his focus is economics, but with a long-standing interest in computer science. We motivate the whole talk with this question. When one object makes a request of another object, why do we expect the second object's behavior to satisfy the first object's wishes? We're not the only field in which such questions are relevant. Many complex systems can be characterized as consisting largely of networks of entities making requests of other entities, not just object-oriented programs, but also human organizations and human economies. We stand on a long tradition of computer science borrowing ideas from economics. In object-oriented software construction, Bertrand Meyer writes, like an economist, we are interested in individual agents, not so much for what they are internally as for what they have to offer each other. Much of object-oriented design is indeed designed by contract, and as we all know, the resulting design by contract ideas have been of tremendous influence in our field. Any such interdisciplinary investigation is an orthogonal cut through the world and necessarily must touch lightly on many different topics that other disciplines have studied in quite a lot of depth. So, so the price of this is tremendous oversimplification, so beware. In the first talk, part of the talk, we're going to discuss the making of requests. Then we'll discuss the aligning of the decisions by the entities involved in these networks of request making, and then the trade-offs involved in aligning the requests, aligning the behavior rather, and how all of this bears on the division and composition of knowledge in networks of such entities. A simple example uh, in our world of request making is when a parser asks a stack to push a token in economics, a simple request might be that I have a gift I want to um, my dad to receive, so I walk into a package delivery business and I ask them to deliver the gift. In economics, the term for the request-making entity is the principle and the term for the entity that responds to the request is the agent. When both principle and agent are humans, these relationships are studied by economics. What we want to do is not just borrow ideas from economics as an analogy, rather, we need to recognize that the world we're already in is one of dynamic shifting networks in which objects make requests, in which humans make requests of objects through user interfaces, objects make requests of each other, and objects make requests of human beings Think through user interfaces, think work workflow systems, or the user interfaces exposed to an Uber driver.
So these networks shift and change, and which roles in these networks are held by humans or objects change quickly and will change many times. So what we wish to do is find ways to reason about these networks that transcend the differences between the, the human world and the software world. First, some definitions. The principal is the one making the request. The agent is the one who receives and reacts to the request. Incentive alignment in economics is when a principal or agent implicitly assumed to be human uses incentives to induce the other's intentions to align with their own. By align, we mean compose well without interference. We coined the term decision alignment as a generalization of incentive alignment. Decision alignment is when a principal or agent uses various tools to make it more likely for the other's decisions and actions to align with their own. The contrasts are, we drop the implicit assumption that we're dealing with human beings. We also do not assume that we're dealing with objects. We're trying to be neutral across those worlds. We don't emphasize incentives as a special category. Rather, we just consider it to be one tool among many to be brought to bear on the problem. And we care about what the agents actually do. We don't much care about whether that is what they intended to do. So in economics, it's very important that these relationships are examined both from the principal's perspective and from the agent's perspective symmetrically. And, so, and we agree that is important. However, for purposes of this talk, we're going to take the principal's perspective and examine what tools the principal can use to shape the behavior of the agent. Economics started off trying to think about these problems purely in terms of incentive alignment and found that because of hidden information in various ways, they could not solve this problem in that way. They needed to bring in other elements. Oops. They needed to bring in other elements. So they divided the problem into three phases. Before the request is actually made, there's the pre-phase in which the principal is faced with the problem of hidden characteristics, of things that it does not know about the agent that it might be making the request of. In the post phase, the principal is faced with the problem of hidden actions. It might not be able to tell what it is that the agent actually did. Now in economics, the focus is on intentional misbehavior. So this creates uh, very particular hazards that arise from this lack of information. Computer science is mostly focused on accidental misbehavior, which is to say bugs. So the particular hazards that arise from this lack of information are different, but the overall structure is just as useful for us as it is for them. In both cases, we can think of each of these phases as consisting of the following steps. The principal first selects an agent, then inspects the agent that it selected based to, to, in order to determine what its abilities or limits might be. Then a request itself contains three components. There's what the request allows the agent to do in service of the principal. There's the explanation. What is it that the principal actually wants the agent to do? And then there's arranging to reward the agent if it, if it actually does those things. And then in the post phase, there's various kinds of monitoring 
to see what the agent is actually doing or has done. And then the feedback from the information gathered feeds back into selection to guide the selection decision of this and other principles. For expository purposes, we rearrange this, sli this slide like so because we want to focus in on the steps and focus on the fact that they occur in a loop. The ordering that we see here is mostly expository. Pre clearly comes before request, comes before post, but the order of steps within the, these phases is purely an expository convenience and the reality will differ from case to case. So economists first examined shaping these relationships in the human world purely using incentives, found that that wasn't adequate, and expanded to take into account these other steps in the relationship, all of which are tools that can be brought, jointly brought to bear by the principal to help shape the agent's behavior. What we're doing is recognizing commonalities between what they're describing and what we've always done in computer science in order to generalize this framework to cover both worlds and to enable it to reason about a mixed world. And in so doing, we drop the special focus on incentive alignment and just consider it to be one tool out of many. Let's talk about package delivery. So, when I want to deliver a package, the first thing I need to do is select a package delivery service. I do this on the basis of reputation. Is this one I've heard of before? And fit, does it offer the services I need? If my dad's birthday is tomorrow, I might need one that offers overnight delivery. In this scenario, inspect is not relevant, so we skip directly to allow. In order to enable them to deliver the package, I must give them the package. I ex and then explain to them what I want them to do with it, what address to deliver it to, any other delivery instructions. And then I pay them creating an incentive for them to follow through. Now, the agent has my package. It's literally out of my hands. Am I left in the position of only being able to hope and pray? Well, no. There's monitoring of various kinds. The package delivery service might offer tracking or return receipts. And in any case, I can ask my dad if he received it and whether it was damaged and all the information that results from that monitoring, I can feed back to guide the selection, uh, the future selection decisions of both myself and other principals. Now let's apply this framework to software. Before we can apply it to software, we must, we must distinguish the two worlds, the static world of design and development time and the dynamic world of runtime. In the static world, the principles and agents of interest are developers and code. And in the dynamic world, they're objects making requests of other objects at runtime. For normal software development, incentives are not really relevant 
uh, objects don't try to induce good behavior from the other objects. So we de-emphasize that and we'll skip it in our software development loop. So selection starts out, hire the best programmers, find good libraries, build on those. We spend a tremendous amount of effort in the inspect phase with code reviews and static analysis tools. And then in the allow phase, we arrange for the program when run to be allowed to take various actions. Generally, what we do is we run the program as the user it's running on behalf of, and therefore the actions it's allowed are all the actions that that user is allowed. The square root function in your math library is allowed by your system to delete all of your files. This excess authority invites attack and creates vulnerabilities. The object capability work provides an interesting alternative that starts off by shifting the static dynamic boundary to include allow. So what actions are allowed is determined on a per request basis. This has a direct analogy in our package delivery story when in asking them to deliver the package, I give them the package. Then explain is the topic of API design. It's the, uh, each API defines a little language that the principal uses to express its desires to the agent. And there's a lot to be said here, but we'll come back to that later in the talk. And then while the agent is reacting to the request, instrumentation of various sorts monitors what it is doing, and that information is very useful for testing and for generating bug reports. So as we examine these worlds of humans, objects, and user interfaces, and we look at them from the perspective of each of these six steps, we find that each of the cells is occupied by interesting activity, and many of them are studied by separate disciplines. Uh, to a shocking degree, each cell is discussed and studied in isolation from the other cells. So now let's look at some of the ways in which these elements combine. We're going to use the, the metaphor of an audio mixing board. For each of these steps, the principal has many choices they can make. On an audio mixing board, each slider can be set independently of every other slider, but not all settings, not all combinations of slider settings sound good. Some of them work much better with, uh, with other settings of the other sliders. Well, selecting an agent might range from open entry to more gated, to having stronger admission controls into the candidate set of agents. Internal inspection can range from code reviews to full machine check verification of correctness. Allowing actions range from providing very broad authority, which is a necessary consequence of providing the authority statically, um, to very narrow least authority. The requests that are explained can be more for informal or can be more formally specified. And reward can range from just providing guidance, like the reward function exposed to a machine learning system, or it can actually be trying to induce good behavior, uh, such as paying the package delivery company. And monitoring can serve the purpose of providing feedback and also 
uh, detecting uh, corruption and stopping it um, quickly, uh, and also to be able to repair the damage. When we take a look at the package delivery service, in terms of these sliders, these are the settings that we come up with. When we do so for internal software development, these settings are the ones that seem representative to us instead. We've analyzed some other scenarios. What happens within human organizations when principal and agent are both employees of the company, the there's a heavy dependence on the gating of who is allowed into the company. And within the company, uh, the, the requests that are made are often very informal and based on, on shared understanding that's never written down. And in computer security, uh, the safe plugin boundary that I talked about at, my, on the, at the um, Frozen Realms talk on Monday and Tuesday is a trust boundary between a framework and plugins that would plug into that framework, where the framework does not trust the plugins. And engineering uh, for such a system seems to have uh, this as a representative set of settings. It's much more open entry. It's sort of the point. Anybody can write a new plugin and offer it to be plugged in. And in order to have a framework that people can, can contribute plugins to, the interfaces must be more formally specified. Bitcoin and Ethereum form a very curious case because they push some of these sliders to the extreme. In particular, they push open entry to the extreme. These are known as permissionless systems. Nobody needs anybody's permission to participate, and nobody can be evicted for bad behavior. In order to, to cope with the consequences of completely open entry, they put a lot of pressure on the design of incentive systems, pushing that to the opposite extreme, uh, where they try to create this whole architecture of incentives that by itself pushes all the participants into behavior that continues to sustain the system over time. And they've been successful at that. An interesting example that demonstrates how some of these elements are better used together comes from Ka Ping Yi's thesis on building reliable voting machine software. In this scenario, he examines the programmer is assumed to possibly be biased and may, that the programmer might wish to bias the election. So neither the programmer nor the code that he writes is trusted. However, the programmer must seem to have satisfied Tony Hoare's prescription of having written a voting machine that is so simple that it is obviously correct. And in fact, what Ping presented in his thesis was the code for a working voting machine that consisted of 400 very simple lines of code in a simple first order language. And he wrote, extensive prose rationale justifying every single line of code in there. He then subjected that code to intense review, intense security review, and the hope was that by uh, having a very, very simple code with extensive rationale, uh, that the reviewers would be able to verify by review that it was correct. So to test this, Ping inserted three bugs into the code, each of which could bias the election. 
and all of which were carefully crafted to escape review. So we know that intense review of simple code is fairly effective at spotting accidental bugs. What we found was that Ping's attempt to insert the bugs such that they evaded review was successful. He, they did evade review. I was one of the reviewers that failed to spot the bugs. And in fact, none of the reviewers spotted all the bugs, and, there, and one bug escaped notice by all the reviewers and could have gone on to bias an election in this scenario. So the lesson here is that malicious bugs can easily be written to escape detection by review, even under the best of conditions. And we've always known that malicious bugs can be written to escape detection purely by black box testing. The interesting thing is that it seems much harder to write malicious bugs that evade detection when review and testing are brought together. And that's, that's harder than it seems like it would be just from the difficulty created by reviewer testing considered by themselves. Why is this? Well, let's take a look at a, at a very oversimplified example. Uh, this code has an off by one bug. It's notoriously hard to spot off by one bugs in other people's code. So perhaps this looks fine and passes review. However, an off by one bug like this fails when tested against zero and one. So it will quickly be spotted even by a small amount of testing. Alternatively, this code is written to evade detection under exhaustive testing. And the reason is that exhaustive black box testing will never hit the condition that triggers the trap door. However, the things you need to do to evade testing when subject to careful review look weird. They look weirder than the bugs that, that Ping was able to successfully hide. So the, so the hope is that the characteristics that make a bug able to evade de detection by testing make it more obvious to review and vice versa. Another example bringing these same two elements together we saw in Ulfar Erlingson's um, uh, keynote from Monday morning where by combining static analysis and massive data gathering from the program as run in the world, he's able to provide better security than you might think from the strength of static analysis or data gathering considered by themselves. So what's going on here? Well, a tool when employed just by itself, stressed to solve the entire problem sometimes, not always, it depends on the particulars, hits a, a cost curve that blows up. We can think of this as the price of perfection. And backing off from the perfect solution, we can consider to be a compromise. But by artfully combining compromises on several different dimensions, we can still create an, a, a significant degree of aggregate strength while staying away from the prohibitive parts of the cost curve. But this only works well if our combinations are cross-bracing. If the strengths of one compensate for the weaknesses of the other. If they have correlated weaknesses, the combination is still stronger, but it's less stronger than you might have hoped for. Package delivery illustrates the weakness of trying to solve these problems using only incentives. Over here, the box represents the space of all possible agent actions. Every point within the box is something the agent might do. 
when I walk up to the counter with the package I want delivered, oh, I'm sorry, the green circle are all of the agent actions which would be to my benefit. When I walk up to the counter with the package to be delivered, of all the things that the clerk might do that are to my benefit, the ones that I have in mind are for him to deliver the package. That's what I'm prepared to pay him for. So if he delivers the package and I pay him, then he wins and I win. Um, those are the points that are of benefit to both. Of course, there's various things he could do that would cause me to suffer. He might damage or lose or steal the package. Now, bringing in the allowed dimension, if the, if the agent is simply allowed to do all of these things, then it's very hard to solve this just with incentives because the agent will always derive some benefit from stealing the package. Um, and if he's deriving benefit from actions that hurt me, I'm in trouble. Now, we could try to solve this in the pure computer, pure computer security style solution by taking the least of least authority seriously, of saying that the only action that the agent is allowed to do is deliver the package. That if the agent damages or loses or steals the package, he's doing something illegal. And, um, that those are prohibited actions. The problem is that if damaging or losing the package is illegal, it's not practical to run a package delivery service. And if anyone tries to run a package delivery service under those conditions, they have to charge astronomical prices. So fortunately, we can recognize that the agent doesn't particularly benefit or get hurt if he damages or loses my package. It affects me a lot. It doesn't affect him very much. So instead, we can provide the agent narrow authority, but not literally least authority, where the only thing that we really need to prohibit is the area of danger where harm to me coincides with benefit to him. And an honest package delivery service would not find this prohibition to be a burden. And then the remaining problem, having taken that area of danger off the table, the remaining problem of inducing the agent to deliver my package is one that can be dealt with by incentives. In language-based software security, we face a logically identical landscape. In the safe plugin problem, a malicious plugin might try to attack the framework, and we can divide the attacks, as usual, between integrity attacks and availability attacks. Now, we need to recognize that most of the reasons why a plugin might be interested in attacking the framework are attacks on integrity. Attacks on availability, um, there's rarely any reason to engage in those attacks. And fortunately, attacks on integrity, we can defend against by employing safe language techniques like truly encapsulated objects. Attacks on availability can consist of things like the plugin just goes into an infinite loop when it's invoked, wedging the framework. Now, it can do that, but it has very little reason to. And safe language techniques have a tremendous problem trying to defend against that. It's very difficult for safe language techniques to provide good defenses against those kinds of attacks. but there will always be some weird attacker that decides it's in their interest to deny service, whether for bragging rights or for fun or whatever. 
So this picture only makes sense when coupled with at least a little bit of selectivity. A, a plugin that repeatedly simply wedges its framework will stop being plugged in. So when we look at how these elements complement each other, we don't just want to look at them individually, and we don't just want to look at them in pairs, like the blue struts here. We need to understand that the overall context is one of many structural members, the, the legs of, of, of this piece of furniture as well, and we need to take a look at the overall structural integrity and what the, the overall weaknesses and strengths are as these things play together. Let's talk about the division of labor, which is really the division and composition of knowledge. And this brings us back to API design, the issue of a principal explaining to the agent what they want the agent to do. These explanations can be at the more informal end of the spectrum. The parser might just open code the push in terms of an underlying array. Um, or if I know that you're going to be seeing my dad tomorrow, I might just hand you the box and say, could you drop this off with my dad when you see him? Or we might have more formally specified, more, more, more explicitly articulated abstractions that sit between the principal and the agent like stack and package delivery. And the big advantage of these articulated abstractions is they enable a multiplicity on each side. They abstract over the multiple ways in which an agent might implement this interface. And, and they simultaneously abstract over the multiple reasons why a principal might want to, to uh, employ such an abstraction. And it's when it abstracts from both sides that we call it an abstraction boundary. Such an abstraction boundary does a good job at giving us the information hiding that, that Parnas recommended. It shields both principal and agent from, from, de from needing to have detailed knowledge of each other. When we examine various scenarios and set the sliders to the settings that we think are representative of them, we find that some interesting patterns emerge. And some of these patterns cross-cut the differences between humans and objects. So over here, uh, the left column are those scenarios in the human world. The right column are the scenarios in the object world. The scenarios on the first world, on the first row, um, depend heavily on gating. They're generally organized um, such that the, the dominant shape of the network is a hierarchy. Because they, they depend so heavily on gating, they're rather trusting within that system. The arrangements are mostly informal, and being informal and one-to-one, -one, we would say these arrangements are very concrete. On the other hand, we have the package delivery service, or more generally, businesses offering services on the market, in which there's open entry, the dominant network structure is a decentralized network, because of the open entry, principals and agents have to be much more wary, have to be much more defensive on their own against the possible misbehavior of who they're dealing with. And to enable this multiplicity that we have in the market, uh, these relationships have to be on the, the more specified side. 
And we find that the security boundaries that we engineer in the safe language work have many, like the safe plugin boundary, have many of the same characteristics. So, in summary, we already exist in a world of mixed networks of humans and objects all making requests of each other. And these, these networks are changing and shifting rapidly. And we need to be able to reason over, over the whole network independent of which role is currently held by a human or object because those roles will shift. The information hiding that Parnas recommended that we so value in computer science that we seek by dividing knowledge is, is also the information hiding that creates various hazards. Um, it's worth those hazards, but we should recognize the hazards. And these hazards are studied in economics, uh, but with their focus being intentional misbehavior The structure of cross-bracing and the way in which these things support or do not support each other uh, is worthy of study. And as we design languages and systems and, and tools, these compositions of compromises are also worthy of support. We should have the, the larger picture in mind as the system we're trying to support. And we need to better understand the emergent properties of networks of such relationships when things go right and when things go wrong. When things go right, we want to maximize the benefits that come from cooperation. And when things go wrong, we want to limit the damage. Uh, thank you for the talk. I was, um, I, uh, even though somehow uh, uh, deep down I knew that we are uh, um, operating um, at different levels and uh, different layers, the, the way that you explained to us how these layers are related to each other and how combined they can bring um, a better effect, uh, that, that was really illuminating. Uh, the question that I have is um, in your you're in uh, what you showed us, you are talking of uh, the objects being one system, and the, but there are many systems, and uh, they leak stuff to each other. For instance, the package delivery, I will give them the address of my dad, and then they can use, uh, leak them to somebody and use them. Can, your, uh, ca can this be also described in your picture? Well, yes, um, uh, partially in a negative manner, uh, which is that we do interact with agents desiring them to keep secrets. Uh, companies have NDA agreements. They want their employees to keep lots of secrets. Um, and we use various means to try to gain confidence that the secrets will be kept. Um, uh, we do a lot of upfront vetting, which you can consider to be both partially selection and partially vetting. Um, we try to do monitoring to see if the secrets are leaked. But the negative result there is of all the things that the, of all the misbehaviors the agent might engage in that are hard for the principal to know about, leaking secrets is one of the hardest. Uh, it's one of the, the easiest kinds of misbehavior to evade uh, detection by monitoring. So leaning more heavily on the inspection when you're on an automated system um, makes sense 
uh, among people, you can't inspect them by doing a formal proof that they will correctly uh, uh, obey an NDA. I have a question. Um, maybe uh, too close to things. Okay. So uh, the uh, one of the reasons the package delivery system works is because. The uh, person I give money to has their own life. They want to spend the money on movies and so on. And so there's an actual hard currency that trades hands, and they have an incentive to have more of that currency. That's our assumption. Um, you know, computational systems, you sort of stop talking about that part of it when you got to the computational mm -hmm. system, because what do we do? We give them cycles, we give them memory, a network connection, and they have no real incentives or interest. They don't have a life. So how would you change that? How would you make the computational system have more of a life? Because one possible way is to feed that back into the static world, right? You could imagine GitHub, every time you use a library call, that gets reflected back in GitHub and somebody's score goes up, and now that agent has an incentive. So tell me more about how to give a life to computational agents. So Eric Rexer and I, back in the late 80s, uh, uh, did some... Um, uh, work on computational markets. Uh, and this was specifically focused on bringing the incentive aspect of markets, the running prices, into, into the software system. Uh, and the motivation was still not to induce objects to do the right thing, but rather to provide price information uh, that would be a decentralized signal to guide objects to making trade-offs that serve the system as a whole, to guide decentralized resource allocation trade-offs. So memory space, processor time, network bandwidth were all uh, allocated through running auctions. We came up with uh, forms of auction that could be run very efficiently. Uh, and the idea is that an individual agent sees some prices at the moment for um, these various resources, and only it knows how it can trade those resources off. And by trading those resources off, it then affects the prices, which propagates to the, to the trade-offs made by other agents. Now, when I did this work, I fully expected that prices to guide decisions would become a part of software systems well before software systems grew to the size they are now. Um, and that's part of why in sort of revisiting this connection with economics, I've been drawn to say, well, okay, if we de-emphasize the incentives and focus on the rest of it, there's still a lot of useful connection with economics. There's a lot of useful things to borrow. And it's actually much more informative of what we actually do. Now, um, uh, is it, would it still be useful to import Prices into computation, yes. Uh, to do so well, you actually do need to connect it to real-world prices. We did an experiment at some labs in the 90s where we got clearance from their accounting system that their internal accounting dollars were the ones that researchers were spending and earning by running services within the system. Thank you for the talk. Um, how do you relate the concepts um, uh, that you? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, how do you relate the, the concept that you described in this talk with the current status of um, agent-oriented programming and multi-agent systems? Uh, I have not. Uh, clearly, it's relevant uh, with agent-oriented programming. If I understand it, I've not. This is not an area that I've looked into deeply. But as I understand it, um, it's uh, much more oriented around giving the agents goals and letting the agents do the planning of how to satisfy those goals. Uh, is that, would that be a fair characterization? Um, uh, so in any case, like I said, it's not an area I've investigated. I think it is relevant to this framework, but I've not thought about it.